within the Soviet Union gave conflicting reports about new squadrons of long-range bombers. The question was, how do you find out what's going on inside of the night country? One which doesn't permit people to even talk about what they're doing. And where it's impossible to find out from government sources what's going on inside that country. We had peripheral uh, reconnaissance programs, uh, which exist to this day. It was imperative that the United States find a way to fly over the Soviet Union to photograph their most secret military installations. The CIA paid a visit to the Skunk Works and discussed their problem with Johnson. Money was no object. Uh, the cost of this, uh, of any activity, uh, was peanuts compared to what it would cost to try to fight a war against the Soviet Union without knowing what they were up to. The result of this meeting was a crash course in spy plane design and production. Operating under the most stringent security precautions ever taken, Kelly Johnson turned out a remarkable airplane, the U-2. Basically a jet-powered glider, its long wings and light weight allowed the U-2 to fly at over 70,000 feet, nearly double the ceiling of existing jet fighters, and well above the Soviet anti-aircraft capabilities. After only 22 months of development, the elegantly simple aircraft was ready to be tested. Uh, I was a flight test mechanic in the first airplane, there was two of us. The flight test program went so fast, I mean, to today's deal, it's unbelievable. It was just a matter of uh, four or five weeks until we had reached 70,000 feet with the airplane. It took far less time than anybody expected. And the U-2, as it became known, came in under budget and under uh, deadline. The management of the U-2 project was a unique partnership between the intelligence community and the military. By 1957, U-2 aircraft were regularly overflying the Soviet Union and photographing key military installations. The Soviets tracked these flights on radar, but were powerless to stop the high-flying spy plane. Despite repeated efforts to shoot it down, none of their aircraft or surface-to-air missiles could reach the altitude of the U-2. However, when pilot Francis Gary Powers boarded his craft on the morning of May 1st, 1960, little did he realize that he was flying off into history. The Soviets finally developed a high-altitude surface-to-air missile and deployed it that morning. The result was one of the most infamous Cold War incidents. Powers survived the crash, but was captured by the Soviets and placed on trial for espionage. An embarrassed President Eisenhower immediately ceased all overflights of the Soviet Union. But the U-2 lived on. New, more powerful engines allowed it to operate at even higher altitudes, with more accurate cameras. Well, of course, it had a widely publicized role in Cuba. Photographs taken from U-2s over Cuba proved to the world that the Soviets were installing intermediate-range missiles. Ironically, the plane that almost started World War III in 1960 kept us from going to war two years later. Nearly 50 years after its first flight, the U-2 continues in use worldwide and has established itself as the foremost reconnaissance aircraft through its amazing adaptability. I doubt if there's a, in the last 20 or 30 years there's ever been two U-2s in exactly the same configuration. You look at the U-2 today, it's had I don't know how many different radars in the nose over the last 50 years. And originally it didn't have any radar. Today's U-2 is vastly improved compared to the original model and carries out a number of additional duties. NASA uses one of these high-altitude craft for scientific research projects that aid environmental impact studies. After nearly five decades of service, the U-2 and its many variants show absolutely no signs of slowing down. 
and will remain in operation for a long time to come. What do you mean homeowner's insurance doesn't cover floods? A few inches of water cost all this? But I don't even live near the water. What you don't know about flood insurance may shock you, including the fact that a preferred risk policy starts as low as $119 a year. For an agent, call 1-888-FLOOD-40. By 1960, Soviet anti-aircraft weapons had caught up with the U-2. All of a sudden, it became vulnerable. It was imperative that the U.S. quickly develop a totally new spy plane. They took the U-2 as high as it could go, and it was still in a threat envelope. But everybody wanted to be able to have that open sky sort of feeling about the target structure. And so that's when they went to work on the SR. Again, the CIA approached Lockheed, but this time with a new proposition. A spy plane that could operate at 100,000 feet, nearly four miles higher than the U-2, and cruise at 2,200 miles per hour, more than three times the speed of sound. No one thought that such goals were attainable, except Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works team. The first time I ever heard the phrase coin, the ability to think out of the box, I immediately thought of Kelly Johnson because what he did and the way he went about doing it was like nobody ever had done before. The SR-71 represented a quantum leap in aircraft construction and manufacturing. The challenges in manufacturing were stupendous. The tooling people, they couldn't make tools hard enough to form the titanium. You'd have a form block, you'd put the raw material in it, you'd put it in an oven, heat it to about 1,500 degrees for two hours, and then you put it in a press. One of the byproducts of high-speed flight is friction, which translates to heat. The SR-71 was surely going to be the hottest aircraft ever flown. The coolest place on the outside of the airplane is as hot as you can get your oven, 450 degrees. In some places, it's 2,000. The hydraulic fluid, when we tested the airplanes for leaks on the ground, you heat it to 500 degrees before you put it in the airplane. And then you pressurize it to 3,300 pounds. And if it sprung a leak and you were standing there, it'd go right through you. It'd burn a hole right through you. So the guys have to wear asbestos suits to check the leaks. In less than three years, the SR-71, dubbed Blackbird for its menacing dark finish, took to the skies. But as the SR-71s came online, a whole host of operational problems needed to be addressed. Pilots needed to have customized spacesuits just to survive at the SR-71's lofty cruising altitude. And there was the ever-present issue of keeping the Blackbirds fuel. It required a whole new concept of tanker support. Those engines ate fuel, and they ate it in a hurry. You had to have 